All right, so lithium hydroxide to getting moles. We're just gonna do a quick molecular weight calculation, right? 0 0.325 grams. And what's the molecular weight of lithium hydroxide? 24 or so? Twenty three point nine. That's right. A little bit louder. Nine point nine. Thank you. Nothing tricky here, right? So what do we get for our moles? Three, six. Then if we have a volume and a concentration, that's another pretty straightforward conversion to get to moles, right? I can even do this one in my head. Thing. So, 125 milliliters. Capital M is moles per liter, right? So, if we say, if we put this into liters, so a thousand milliliters, it's one liter. And then we can say for every one liter is 0.1 moles. So divide by a thousand or by a thousand, just move the decimal three places and then multiply by 0.1, moves the decimal in one more spot. All right, so if it's all one to one, that's enough right there to tell what's our limiting reactant, right? But in this case, since we don't care about our product, we care about how much is left over, we wanna know excess reagents. So we're gonna be running out of the nitric acid first because it's one-to-one, -one, we can just say, okay, well, I have fewer moles of the nitric acid and every one mole of the nitric acid used is one mole of the lithium hydroxide used. Still not a bad idea to write it out even though it's one-to-one, -one, just so you can show yourself and that the, the math works out. So 0 0.0125 moles of nitric acid. One mole HNO3 is one mole LiOH used. So we're just going to subtract them, right? If we have 0 0.0136 moles of lithium hydroxide and we're going to use 0 0.0125 moles, our moles of the hydroxide that are left over is just going to be zero, what we started with minus what we used. Zero, zero, one, one. <laughs> All right. If our final goal is to get to pH, how does this help us? Where are we going to go from here? Close. We have hydroxide as our leftover. We know that if we want to get to P anything, we got to take negative log of that, but it's not negative log of moles. It's negative log of concentration in molarity. So you've got to take your moles, divide by your volume. If we were mixing two solutions together, which is what we saw on the test, right? 
on the excess reactant concentration question. It was mixing two solutions together. And a number of people just used one of the volumes to find your final concentration at the end. If you're mixing two solutions together, you have to add the two volumes. In this case, we're talking about adding a solid to a solution. This is our final volume, it's 125 milliliters. All right, so just to lay out where we're going here, we know that pH plus pOH equals 14. So we want to get pOH since we have leftover hydroxide, which is so pOH negative log of concentration of hydroxide. So then we need to find concentration of hydroxide after the reaction, which is going to be moles of hydroxide divided by liters of solution. Zero, I did it again, zero, zero, one, one, divided by 0 0.125 liters, L is liters, liters of solution. Sorry, I use the subscript to say not, you know, specifically not liters of anything, liters of the whole mixture. You want 125 liters. 125 mils divided by a thousand. Probably because I keep erasing stuff by when I uh, point at it. That's 125. So we'll get something like what's our concentrate, our final concentration of hydroxide? 0 0.09. And how many sig figs are we going to keep? Keep two sig figs. So point, you said eight, eight. Yeah. And then once you get your con your final concentration of hydroxide. So sometimes what I'll do too is with the final concentration of your excess reactant, you put a little subscript F at the end for final because we don't want to use our starting concentration of anything. Parker? Divided by point. Oh, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Good catch. Once we get this though, if if we had excess acid, we'd be done. If we got, well, have to take the negative log of it, right? But because we use pH to define how acidic or alkaline a solution is rather than pOH, even if hydroxide is what we have left over, we're always gonna put it in terms of pH just because that's the standard. Acidic solutions in nature, and especially in, in living systems, are way more common than alkaline solutions. Alkaline solutions are fairly rare in nature, unless you get into geology, um, and specifically groundwater. But even then, acidic solutions are more common than basic solutions. So that's why we, one of the reasons why we tend to use pH as the standard unit rather than pOH. But there's really no difference. We just have to go one extra step because if we take the negative log of this, we'll find pOH. So negative log of 0 0.0088, which should give us something close to 2, 2.1 maybe.
So then what's the pH going to be? Yeah, it's just 14 minus 2.06. So technically 11.94. What do we do with the sig figs in units? This is the part where you say, I, I don't know, you're the teacher. Basically, exponents and logs have their own rule for sig figs, but I'm not going to teach you a third rule for sig figs. So for this class, when we take the log of something, we're just always going to go to the hundredths place. All right, so I'm going to remove all decision making from you when it comes to logs. For pH, in POH, you always go to the hundredths place. For those of you who are interested, um, the real rule for logs is you keep the same number of decimal places as you had sig figs. Because the one, the ones place is basically just the power to the power of 10, right? What you, what you had. And so the ones place doesn't count as a sig fig when we take the log of something. But again, that gets really confusing. So I'm not going to hold you to remembering that for pH, always go to the hundredths place. What's the concentration of hydroxide? Or sorry, concentration of um, hydronium in the final solution of H pluses. How can we solve that? Well, pH is the negative log base 10 of hydronium concentration or H plus concentration. If we were just looking at it like it's limiting reactant and treating it like it wasn't acid base solution, like it went to completion, we would just say that the concentration of hydronium is zero because we used it all up, right? We used up all of our acid. But because when we're talking about acids and bases, you always have some small amount, both of hydroxide and hydronium when you're in water. If you have a pOH of 2.06 and pH of 11.94, you still have some small amount of H3O plus floating around. It's just really small. If we know the pH, we can get to H3O plus. How do we solve this algebraically? Who knows their rules for logs? Yeah, 11.94 equals negative log base 10 of X of our hydronium concentration. How do you undo a log? Use to the, you use the power, right? I always remind myself, well, when you take the log of something, you're trying to solve for an exponent, right? So if we want to solve for what's inside the log, we take, the, we take both sides and raise it to the power of the base. So we do 10 to the power of, of 11, negative 11.94. I'll rewrite that so it's not as confusing. So 10 to the negative 11.94 equals concentration of H3O plus. In other words, a really small number, but not zero, technically. Depending on how we're measuring it, it's really close to zero within sig figs. 
but we can still get an answer here. So what it, so a little bit less than, so what, nine times 10 to the minus 11? Well, yeah. All right, so pH is not all that different than what we've done before. It's just one extra step on an excess reactant problem, right? That one extra step involves logs, which makes it scary and intimidating, but learn how to use your calculator, whatever calculator you're using so that you know how to input your logs and know how to do your exponentials. And it's, Really, it's almost just like a vocab term, right? You just have to know what pH means. And it's just building on stuff we've already done. So if acidity and alkalinity is just concentration of H3O plus, why do we care? Why do we care whether solutions are acidic or basic, if it may or may not have any effect on the chemical reactions that we're doing in that solution. Why is hydronium and hydroxide, why do they have such a important role? Like, because anybody, people who have never even taken a chemistry class have heard of pH before, right? Why do, why does the average person care whether something is acidic or not? Why do we rate solutions like that in terms of rating it in, ter in terms of its lithium concentration? I guess that we do kind of rate it on its lithium concentration if lithium happens to be present. Any guesses? It's the same reason that dissolved in water gets its own phase because every water-based solution is gonna have hydronium and hydroxide in it, right? And since almost every solution and every living system is based around water, water kind of has a more important role in most, in most of life than many chemicals. Why, why is an acidic or an alkaline solution dangerous? We, you know, I remember Saturday morning cartoons in the nineties and um, you know, somebody would spill acid on the floor and it'd eat through the floor, right? But denatures proteins. If so, yeah, we actually have developed. So I'm going to transition into the second thing you said because that was a really good point. Um, it denatures our proteins. Basically, our proteins fold in a certain way based on the pH of a solution. Our proteins stop working. They stop performing the function that our cells need them to perform if you change the pH too much from where they were, where it's supposed to be. So it winds up being really important for living things what the pH of a system is. And it's so important for living things that we actually developed a taste evolutionarily. In our evolutionary history, there was a point where things were not able to taste sour or acidic it became enough of an evolutionary advantage for, for an organism to be able to taste the solution and know if it was too acidic, um, that it was going to denature its proteins and cause problems, that, that life on Earth developed a sense specifically to test the pH of solutions. That's what sour is, is you're testing how acidic a solution is. So your sense of taste partly is looking at molecular shapes, but the sour aspect of your taste, taste buds is literally testing the pH. That how sour something is, is based on how acidic it is. 
So that's why we care about pH. That's why pH kind of has its own special place in chemistry and in everyday life, because it does matter to the average person. You don't want to drink something that's really, really acidic because it's going to cause problems for your whole body, mostly your digestive system first, um, but then potentially can cause a lot of issues down the line too. Do we have a taste related to basicity, alkalinity? Not, not as directly. Was that your question, Joel? Yeah, so it's bases do affect us too, but just like I said, how how um, in living systems, especially acidic solutions are way more common. We have a we have a sense dedicated to that because they're so common. Alkaline solutions typically do have a taste to them. They taste bitter usually, but there's a lot of things that can taste bitter. Usually, bitter is just sort of a warning system from your body that hey, whatever you're eating, it's probably not that great for you. Um, but it sort of covers a wide range of potential dangers. Basic things, um, we actually don't even have pain receptors that can detect alkaline. If anybody who's, who's ever gotten lemon juice in a cut knows that we are able to sense um, acidic solutions pretty well and send that as a signal as pain. We actually don't have the same receptors to detect alkaline solutions. So if you get base on your skin, it actually doesn't hurt. Your skin just gets really slippery. Does anybody know what that is? It's the, it's the uh, cell membranes of your skin cells dissolving um, and turning into soap. Um, but it doesn't actually hurt until you get through the top few layers of your skin and get actually into your, your tendons and muscles, typically. It'll hurt later when it dries out and your body starts trying to heal it but it doesn't hurt the same way that getting acid on your skin does, which is kind of crazy. When I was in high school, gloves weren't as common. Plastic you know, gloves weren't used in, in our labs all that often. And so that was actually the warning sign that our teacher gave us. Hey, if you got some base on your skin, if your skin starts feeling slippery, go to a sink right away and wash it off. Um, because you probably spilled some hydroxide on your skin and your skin's dissolving. Parker? Um, anything that's made with, with hydroxides, that, that has a measurable concentration of hydroxides, anything that's going to have a pH of above about nine or so. Nine is going to irritate your skin a little bit, but not that bad. But if you get a higher concentration, then... Basically what we had here, this is about the limit to what you would ever want to get on your skin, um, unless you're doing some sort of fancy chemical peel or something like that. Um, usually those are acidic, but you can exfoliate using, using basic solutions. You have to be careful, um, but it's technically possible without hurting yourself too badly. All right. So. When we're doing these calculations, if we can get from, from concentration of hydroxide to POH to pH all the way to concentration of hydronium, we really only need one piece out of that in order to get to any of those four, right? Because of how they're related and because of this equation, you can go back and forth kind of at will between any of those. As long as you can get to one concentration or if you're given pH or if you measure pOH or pH, you can get to the other three pieces that, of that equation pretty easily. So um, this one's a practice. Oh, I'll change the formatting on my table. Um, Here's a way that I can ask a question that allows that asks you to do all of those steps where it says determine the pH, but it actually it also I can also say just say fill out this whole table. And again, it changed the format on my table. It's supposed to be a table where it says, give me the pH, give me the concentration of hydronium, give me the pOH, give me the concentration of hydroxide. You get to all of that just by figuring out what your excess reactant is and what the concentration of it is. All right, so. We're not going to go through that one right now because I want to talk about lab tomorrow. 
lab tomorrow is basically doing one of these neutralization reactions, except instead of saying, okay, we're going to go, we're trying to find the excess reactant after we mix things, our, con our lab tomorrow, we're going to try and add a very specific amount of one of these reactants until we can say that the, we've perfectly used up the acid or if we perfectly used up the amount of base, right? And this type of lab is called a titration, which you've probably done before, although might not be immediately, you might not remember it immediately. Um, who remembers using the big long burettes with the valve at the bottom? Giant graduated cylinders, right? The whole idea with these titrations is we have, a, if we have a solution of any acid and we don't know what the molarity is, we can figure out what the molarity is if we can add just enough hydroxide to use up all of the acid. If we have some way of measuring what's called the end point of the of the titration, then we can say, okay, well, if this is the point where I just perfectly used up all of this reactant, this acid, and I started with, let's say it was, I don't know, 72.5 milliliters at 0 0.10110 moles per liter. And we had a starting solution that was, let's say it was just, uh, let's say we had 150.0 milliliters at an unknown concentration. So the whole point of a titration is to say that we used up just enough of your of a known solution to perfectly use up an unknown solution. In other words, if it's one to one, we can say that we have the same number of moles of solution A as we have in solution B. If, if we can figure out how many moles we have of the nitric acid and we know what the volume is we started with, we can figure out our initial concentration. All right, so it's, it's almost a little bit backward, but it's the same calculations we've been doing before. Remember all, all of our limiting reactant concentrations where we said, okay, you know, for every one mole of lithium hydroxide, that's one, one mole of nitric acid used. The difference now is we're not trying to figure out what runs out first. We're going to say they're running out at the same time. They're the same number of moles. So how would we figure out what that unknown concentration is? Let's practice doing some ca the calculations here. Well, what's the first thing you do with any any stoichiometry problem if you're not sure what else to do? Put it in moles. So if we're given a volume of lithium hydroxide and we're given a starting concentration of lithium hydroxide, Getting moles is not too tricky, right? It's the same conversion we did before. 72.5 milliliters for every 1,000 milliliters is one liter. And for every one liter of the lithium hydroxide is 0 0.110 moles of hydroxide. So naturally, I didn't make the math easy on myself. I always do that when I'm making up problems. I could pick the numbers and make the math so I could do it in my head, but I didn't do something that smart. 0 0.0725 times 0 0.110. What's our moles of hydroxide? And how many sig figs are we going to keep? Three. 
you have a concentration with three sig figs and your volume was three sig figs. And this is exact. So what is it then? All right, so this next really simple step is why titrations get their own name. Good question. So why was I able to say, go from lithium hydroxide to just moles of hydroxide? Because the lithium is just a spectator ion. The lithium is not doing anything when it comes to using up the nitric acid. To be most correct, I should have left it as lithium hydroxide. But technically, we could use any hydroxide. We could use sodium hydroxide here. We could use potassium hydroxide. If we wanted to get, if we wanted to deal with non one to one ratios, we could even use calcium hydroxide. Um, just because it's the hydroxide that's doing the actual acid base reaction, I just left off the lithium. But That's more correct to put it that way. To answer this question, no. All right. So the only thing that gives titrations its own special name when it comes to these two lab procedures is the assumption that we're making that we're perfectly using up all of our reactants. We added just the right amount of lithium hydroxide so that the nitric acid is perfectly used up with no leftovers. Because that's what's going to be allow us to say, well, we must have the same moles here as we have here. If they're being used up perfectly and it's a one-to-one -one ratio, the moles of lithium hydroxide that we added has to be equal to the moles of nitric acid that we started with. So basically we're saying that moles of HNO3 minus moles of HNO3 used has a final answer of zero moles left. So just to set it up like we did for our other excess reactant problems, we started with a certain number, call that X, minus 0 0.00798 moles of HNO3 used. Well, X minus 0 0.00798 moles used equals zero. That's really easy algebra, right? We can all do that algebra in our heads. Most, I mean, I'm sure we can if you knew to set it up like this. That's what a titration is saying, is that this final number, final moles left over is zero. Right. And so that's why when we do these titrations, why we use the burettes with the, the giant graduated cylinders with the valve at the bottom. So we can measure the volume that we add very, very carefully. Right. So we don't know exactly how many milliliters it's going to take. That's why we do the titration. We go slowly to try and make sure we just barely get to the point where all of our acid is used up. Who remembers what that looks like? think. Yeah, your standard one is you start with two colorless solutions and you use a an indicator called phenolphthalene. Um, which is a mouthful. Anytime you get five consonants in a row in a row, it's uh it's a tricky word to pronounce. Technically it's phenolphthalene. We just usually ignore that, that pH in there when it comes to saying it out loud. Phenolphthalein 
is that compound that's colorless when it's in acidic conditions and it turns pink the second it gets to alkaline solutions. So if you add your phenolphthalein here, technically you could put your phenolphthalein in the burette with the sodium hydroxide and it would just be pink. And then you would, when you added it to your solution, the pink color would disappear and you would just go until it stayed pink. But it's usually easier to tell when you hit that end point if you start with a colorless solution and you add the pink and plus then you have to clean the phenolphthalein out of the burette. For practical reasons, we don't usually do that. Usually you add your indicator to the solution that's being titrated, which is going to be your unknown at the bottom. All right. So just to finish doing the math here, if we want to know what the final, what our initial concentration was of our unknown, Well, if we know how many moles of hydroxide it took to get there, getting our, our concentration of HNO3, I'll usually use a little subscript I to indicate initial. Our initial concentration is just going to be your initial moles of HNO3 divided by your initial volume, right? What's our initial volume? 150 mils, we want it in liters to put it in molarity, right? But we can all do that conversion. So 0 0.1500 liters. And our moles of nitric acid initially is equal to the moles of lithium hydroxide we added, as long as it's a one-to-one -one reaction, which usually it is for acid-base reactions. Otherwise, we would just have to do a quick stoichiometry step to get to moles of nitric acid used. 0 0.00798 moles. What do we get for our initial concentration? Pretty close to half of, uh, so what, 0 0.76. 0 0.798 divided by 1.5 or 0.15. No, that's not right, is it? Well, correct me. What is it? 0.05. And how many sig figs are we going to keep? Three. So 0 0.05. Is it 0 0.05 even? Three two. Three two. All right. So mathematically, that's what tomorrow's lab is about. You're just going to do this yourself, where you're going to use this number. You're going to find this number on your own. You're going to start with a hydroxide concentration that's known. You'll put your hydroxide in the burette. And then you're going to add your hydroxide to what's the most common, common acid that you could buy at the grocery store? What tastes sour, tart? Citric acid would be one. Don't usually sell it. It's already a pre-made solution. Orange juice is, is acidic, and there is we do have a lab that we might be able to do to analyze. It's a titration to analyze the vitamin C concentration in orange juice. We might get to, to do that one um, after, after break. Um, no, think less fruity. Vinegar. So we'll just take white vinegar. White vinegar is going to be your own unknown acid solution. You're going to start with a measured amount of it, and you're going to add some hydroxide solution to it until it turns pink and stays pink, right? And if you do it right, you should be able to get a pretty good answer. However, it's really hard to know when you got to just got to that equivalence point. 
Um, and it's really easy to go over it a little bit. So we're gonna do it as many times as you have time for tomorrow. I, the lab says three, you might only get two titrations in, um, but knowing what you're doing, being able to come in, grab your grab the burettes and, and set things up and get going, um, you should be able to get at least two titrations in. So you'll be able to get two answers that should be relatively close to each other when it comes to the concentration of your acetic acid. All right. Should we do one more? Let's do one where it's not one to one. Most acid base reactions, strong acid, strong base reactions have a, have a concentration of one. We have, we have 10 minutes left, right? Yeah. Okay. So if you're using a hydroxide that is not one to one, calcium hydroxide is a strong base means it, which means it dissociates fully when you put it in water, but it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. That doesn't change that much about our logic when it comes to finding the final pH. It just means we're gonna have a stoichiometry step that's not one-to-one -one moles in the middle somewhere. All right, so I'm not gonna work this one out on the board yet. Let's do this. We'll call this a quick in-class assignment. Everybody get in small groups or work on your own if you want. And let's try and solve this problem. I'll rewrite it up on the board. Start by balancing. Figure out what your excess reactant is. And then tell me at the end of the reaction, what's the pH, what's pOH, hydronium concentration, hydroxide concentration. Oh, 